Well, good morning. How's everybody this morning? Good. It's good to be here in the flesh. Uh, in fact, my wife has a lot to do with that. We celebrate our 19th anniversary on August 31st, a few weeks ago. Praise God. Yeah, she, she should be honored among all women, I tell you. And we're sitting there, we're having our anniversary dinner, and I'm looking into her eyes, and we're looking over candlelight, and we're in this nice restaurant, and we've reviewed the previous 19 years, and I say, well, sweetie, what are you, what are you longing for? What are you hoping for? What are you looking forward to in the, in the next 19 years if the Lord should give us life? And without missing a beat, she looked at me, she says, tomorrow you're going on a diet. <laughs> Praise God, there's less flesh here <laughs> before you this morning than would have been otherwise. It's a joy to be here with you. Let me just thank you for coming. It's, a, it's an honor to be with you and to fellowship with you and to, to think together about God's Word and to, to have the warmth of your conversation and encouragement. Um, it's just, a, it's a, it, it refreshes me to be with you, and so I'm just glad for the privilege to be here. And I want to thank all those volunteers who are wearing orange shirts and gray shirts who are making our time. Yes, please. Um, making our time so enjoyable, and we certainly should give thanks to Scott Anderson and the Desiring God staff and Pastor John and their leadership uh, in bringing this together. And, and could you just give God praise and thanks for one of the group of people? And, and those are the people who are working sound for us. Um, yeah. Yeah. Come here. They, they have the kind of job that really serves us well and encourages us and feeds us for months and maybe years to come as we listen again and watch again online, etc. But we don't often notice them until something goes wrong, you know, until there's a little feedback in the sound or something didn't happen the way we'd hoped to. But these folks serve us quietly and faithfully in the humility of Christ. Uh, and so when you see them, thank them and encourage them for their ministries. Well, it's an honor to be here, so let me pray for us, and let's dive into our topic for this morning. Lord, we do pray that you would be with us even now in a, in a special way, in a powerful way. That you would pour out your Spirit upon us in these moments and would enlarge your work in our minds and in our hearts and in our hands, O oh Lord. We, we're pleading with you for more of you. Lord, we are aware that our praise too often is, is too feeble for your glory. Our, our obedience is too imperfect for, for the honor of your name and, and our thinking too shallow. Our, our thoughts are not your thoughts. Our ways are not your ways. Your thoughts and ways are, are higher than ours. And so, Lord, even as we offer ourselves to you, we, we plead Christ. Father, who is our Savior, our Lord, our Master, our wisdom, our holiness, our redemption. And Lord, we, we plead Christ, who is our, our great high priest, who, who lives even now to intercede for us. We plead, O oh Lord, that our time of thinking together would, Lord, in some way be fitting for the honor and the glory and the dignity of Christ our God, our King, our Savior. So won't you open our minds, open our hearts, take control of our lives in this time we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I have the honor of addressing really a, a big topic. The topic I was assigned was thinking for the sake of global faithfulness, encountering Islam with the, with the mind of Christ. It's a joy to sort of dive into this topic, though I have to confess that, that I came with, uh, even as late as last night and this morning, with some, some intrepidation, a little intimidation. I mean, you get invited to a conference whose theme is think. What happens if you don't? <laughs> and you get sandwiched between Dr. R.C. Sproul and Dr. R. Albert Moeller. So welcome to the cream puff filling. <laughs> in the middle here. <laughs> but 
But I am eager and excited to think with you this morning about this subject. I mean, the fullest expression of Christian living has to be a combination of God's truth entering the head, igniting the affections of the heart, and flowing out in the work of the hands. It is head, heart, hands aligned. So that if we are going to, as it were, enjoy the the fullness of Christ more perfectly and enjoy the fullness of his grace more perfectly, that there needs to be the the entrance into the head of truth from God and the, the working of that truth into the heart and the pushing out of that truth and affection through the hands, the work of God's kingdom. It's interesting that there is uh, an increasing kind of anti-intellectualism and a kind of mindless entertainment built on stereotype when it comes to Islam and Muslims. I don't know if you've noticed even in the sort of popular medium of movies and television how, how 20 years ago, 1980s, the, the bad guys were always the Soviet threat. And now you can watch a sitcom even or a drama and and the bad guys not be Arab Muslims. And along with that shift in imagery is the the language, the kind of adversarial language that, that creates a posture of at least skepticism and often hostility. Language like clash of civilizations, the threat of Islam, extremists. And if I were wordsmithing, even the the very good um, title that we have here, Confrontation. Uh, Beneath this popular expression, this this collage of images, I think you can hear certain questions that are that are frequently asked, certain concerns that, that frequently surface. So, so often I'm asked as people who, who know my background as a, a former Muslim converted out of Islam into faith in Christ, often I'm asked a question, for example, of, of how do I witness to Muslims? And beneath that question often are, are some assumptions like the, the unreachability of, of, of Muslim people or um, the unreasonableness even of Muslim people. Or sometimes I'm asked a different question, that is the question, what to do about Islam? Again, often asked with this posture of of feeling threatened and concerned. And often just really the emotional soil out of which those questions sprout at, at bottom I think I often hear in conversations fear, great fear, deep fear. I I think that a lot of us are afraid of Islam and of Muslims. Perhaps even as you've been walking around Minneapolis the last couple of days, you've seen women in Muslim garb or you've seen obviously dressed Muslim men and and perhaps you've noticed a, a skepticism, a hesitancy, a pulling back in your own soul. It's fear. And where fear takes control, thinking doesn't. So, so for example, we, we see all kinds of responses that, that, that are triggered by fear. There's, there, you, you'll, you'll know these. These are not groundbreaking things. There's, there's a fight response. Flight or fight. So think about the fighting that's going on, on over the, the mosque at ground zero. People rolling up sleeves, bearing knuckles. Or, or the flight that I think is happening in, in our evidence, in our lack of evangelistic zeal, and our lack of missionary zeal when it comes to sharing with our Muslim neighbors and friends. And not only is there fight and flight, but there's accommodation, a kind of uncritical absorption of things and acquiescing. And sometimes the fear manifests itself in just plain old ugly hatred. But we're called to be thinking people, especially as Christians. We're called to love the Lord our God with all of our minds, with all of our intellect in the cause of faithfulness to God and enjoying him forever. 
So thinking, very simply, is, is using one's mind rationally in the evaluation of a subject or a situation. It's to develop a belief, to, to have an opinion or judgment about something. Thinking is not the same as reacting. Nowhere is it more important to distinguish the difference between solid, deep, rich thinking and reaction and reactionism than when we're talking about engaging Islam. Thinking is not just reactionism. And thinking is not the same thing as, as sloganeering. We can't be said to be thinking people if all we're really doing is, is parroting quips and lines and phrases and positions on things that we really haven't thought through. I mean, talk of clash of civilizations, it's this well-known Harvard professor's writing, may make for provocative phraseology, but it does little to help us think. And thinking is not the same as stereotyping. A stereotype is a, a really efficient way to, to simplify complexity. The, the problem with stereotypes is that they tend to take vast amounts of data and information and to reduce them down to a sort of kernel that may have glimmers of truth, but it's not thinking through the complexity. Thinking is not the same as feeling. Uh, the two should be rightly joined, thinking, as we said earlier, first, igniting rich and right and true emotional responses. But beloved, how many of you know that we may feel and feel deeply and feel quickly before we've ever thought through a thing? And this is true in our encounter with our Muslim friends and neighbors. When we feel without thinking, we endanger both our heads and our hearts. A fearful heart undermines a faithful head. So to think well, we must fasten our mind on the right subjects, preferably the, the fundamental issues and not just the, the symptoms and the, and the sort of secondary and tertiary issues. We need to be thinking about the heart of the matter because that affects matters of the heart and of the hands. So in our time this morning, I want us to, to sort of take up our subject in three parts. I want to consider, first of all, the sort of pluralistic context that we, we now live in, in, in the United States at least. I spent a few moments thinking about pluralism and its good forms and its not so helpful forms. And then I want us to think a little bit about Islam in that context and, and answer two questions about Islam. What is Islam and why or is Islam consistently compatible with pluralism? And then thirdly, I pray the Lord would allow us to just sort of dump ourselves into the lap of Christ as we think about what is the Christian's responsibility for encountering Muslims and Islam in this context. And to do that, we'll spend a few moments in Matthew chapter 10 observing a few principles. So let's take up the first question. What, what is pluralism? Well, pluralism is the belief or condition in which Minority groups, whether they are ethnic minorities, religious minorities, or, or other kinds of minority status groups, are able to live in society with a dominant group with sort of full freedom and, and maintenance of their, their sort of cultural and religious identities. Most forms of pluralism hold that, that actually pluralism is, is a benefit to society, that we are stronger through the interchange of ideas and differences with people not like us. And there are terms that are close cousins or siblings to this idea of pluralism. We we'll sometimes hear people talk about multiculturalism or ethnic diversity and other kinds of diversity. Again, the same idea that, that groups with differing backgrounds are able to joyfully, mutually coexist in the same setting. Now, we should say that there are good forms of pluralism and, and bad forms of pluralism. There's some good and right things about this basic notion of a pluralistic society. So number one, it's a, a good thing. It, it recognizes a basic 
reality, that our world is diverse, that there are differences among people in culture and philosophy and religion, among other things. And increasingly, those differences are not over there somewhere. Those differences are right outside the doorstep. The world's getting smaller and people are getting closer and the, the evidence of pluralism is, is just right here. It's right next door. And so one good aspect of pluralism is it, it, it's attempting to deal with the world as it really is in terms of its diversity. The second thing is that pluralism at its best honors some basic human rights like individual freedom and like the liberty, the freedom, to worship God according to the dictates of one's own conscience. And insofar as pluralism helps us to, to see people for who they are and to respect them, it's a, it's a good belief or practice. Insofar as it, it validates the dignity and the uniqueness of human life, then, then pluralism in that sense is a, is a protection of some very cherished and fundamental things. A third reason that pluralism may be valuable is that it does attempt to recognize value in the diversity, value in the, in the variegated forms of thinking and being and acting in the world. And just here, I just want to say that, that some people really act as though the mere existence of diversity or difference is wrong or evil. Some live with a suspicious fear of the other, a, a xenophobia. And, and some think that just the mere existence and the recognition of existence under the banner of things like multiculturalism or ethnic diversity somehow is, is itself to seed ground that shouldn't be seeded and to, and to lose, as it were. Pluralism in its good forms really, really pushes back against xenophobia. It pushes back against bigotry. It pushes back against cultural hegemony. It makes, it makes room for the difference that's really there. And, and in some ways, pluralism as an idea arises, at least in some quarters, as a response to, to ethnocentrism, as a, as a response to a kind of colonialism that, that culturally subjugates people or has historically. So these are some of the benefits of a, of a good pluralism. But on the other hand, there also exists what we might call an uncritical, an unthinking, a, a, a naive form of pluralism. This is the kind of pluralism, the kind of multiculturalism, the kind of, of diversity seeking that, that fails to distinguish between the inherent worth of people made in God's image and the echo of that image in, in, in every human culture and society and the ideas themselves. That there's a difference between valuing people and, and valuing every idea as though every idea is equal in its worth. That's the first mistake in our thinking about our encountering other religious perspectives, including Islam. It's to adopt this naive, this uncritical, this unthinking approach to pluralism. Not all ideas are created equal, and ideas have consequences. We see an example of this in the kind of religious pluralism that says all roads lead to God. All paths lead to God. All religions are beautiful and true. Beloved, that's, that's naive pluralism. That's a, that's a flattening of important differences that really do matter. And so we ought to ask ourselves, why is this kind of pluralism, this kind of naive, uncritical pluralism, why does it find root in our, in our culture today? Why does it find place in our society today? And we don't have time to talk about a lot of things, but let me just mention a few. One is this, this tendency to flatten differences, this tendency to, to, sort, of, to sort of squish together the things that, that, that divide, that, that distinguish, and to ignore them. Real and significant differences that, that matter to the people who are practicing the other philosophies that we're just trying to, to squish together in some amorphous mold. 
And it ignores those things, those differences, at the risk of true well-being and true peace in the culture. And therefore, secondly, this kind of naive pluralism is, is ethically irresponsible because it doesn't deal with real social issues and real challenges. For not only is a pluralistic society uh, a society that derives some benefit from its diversity, it's a society that also derives some challenges from that very same diversity. We, we live in a world where failing to understand real and significant differences that matter to people not like us can result in things like hijackings and bombings and bullets flying. So it's naive not to attend to those things, not to think about those things. And this kind of naive pluralism, thirdly, is unhelpful because it fails to account for the really, the far-reaching effects of pluralism, particularly religious pluralism. You realize that religious perspectives in most cultures touch upon most every aspect of the culture. So it touches upon economics. Think, for example, of something like uh, no interest in Islamic approaches to banking. It, it touches upon politics. Think about the evangelical Christian voting bloc in the United States. It, it touches upon military and war. Remember Bosnia and Herzegovina. Remember the, the troubles in Ireland between Catholic and Protestant. To, to understand our world, we have to understand something about the differences among people in our world, especially religious differences. So as one writer puts it, even if religion makes no sense to you, you need to make sense of religions to make sense of the world. A naive pluralism, basically, turns us all into ostriches. You know, we, we we're that funny looking bird with our head stuck in the sand and our, and our rear end just sort of up, up high, hoping that, that nobody sees us and comes along and, and kicks us in the rear. It's a bad posture, folks. <laughs> it's not a helpful way to engage the world. My son Titus likes to play, likes to play pickaboo and hide and go seek. And, we can even be in the car, and he wants to play hide-and-go-seek, and he has a little blanket that he likes, and he, he, Dad, you can't find me, and he throws the blanket up over his head, and the rest of his body is sticking out, and he, you can see him there curling up tight, like, you know, you can't see me, you can't see me, you can't see me. And I just reach back and pluck him in the forehead, you know. <laughs> and so much of our engagement with people around us not like us it's like my son Titus cowering under his blanket, which only covers a little part of his body, or like that ostrich, head buried in the sand, the rest of his torso exposed. Now, if a naive pluralism is so bad, then why does it find support in our culture? Why, why does it exist? What, what are the things that, that cause it to grow in the lives that we're sharing together? And I, and I want to point to a few things here because at least seeing these few things will sort of set us up to understand why engaging Islam in this context is really fraught with so many difficulties. Okay, so a few reasons why this, this particular naive, uncritical, unthinking kind of pluralism finds room in our culture. And number one, we have become uncomfortable with argument. The culture has become uncomfortable with argument. Stephen Prothero in his book, God is Not One, says very simply, the ideal of religious tolerance has morphed into religious agreement. And we hear people all the time saying, as if it's a superior virtue, I never talk about what? Politics and religion. The next time you see someone says that, you realize you're, you're looking at a talking ostrich. head is in the sand. So there is this discomfort with disagreement, with argument. Secondly, there's a, as we've said already, there's a readiness to blur the significant differences in the, in the goals of, of different religions and, and cultures. You realize that, that not every religion has the same ultimate goal. As Christian people, we're accustomed to thinking that everyone in their religious practice is concerned with some view of salvation. 
Salvation is a, is a distinctively Christian goal, a distinctively Christian idea. You, you don't find the same idea, for example, in Confucianism or, or Buddhism or even in Islam. And see, a naive pluralism doesn't bother to ask the question, what's the goal of this religious perspective or this cultural perspective? Again, Prothero is helpful here. He's a wonderful analogy. He says, here's a multiple choice exam. Let me ask you this one question. Which sport is best at producing runs? Basketball, football, hockey, or baseball? The obvious answer is baseball. And I'm a Baptist, you gotta talk back, all right? <laughs> the obvious answer is, is baseball. Well, why is that the obvious answer? Well, because in basketball, hockey, and football, runs isn't even part of the nomenclature. It's not the goal. In basketball, you're, you're scoring hoops. In football, you're trying to get touchdowns or field goals. And in hockey's goals, runs only make sense as an objective in baseball. And so it is with religious ideals. If we're going to understand them and engage them well, we, we have to resist that naive pluralism that assumes that, that every religion has the same goal, is claim, climbing the same mountain. They're not. They're not even pretending to at their heart. A third reason this, this finds ground in our culture is that there's a, there's, a, there's a tendency to avoid also the big questions in life. One writer, well known to you all, many of you all, is that we, we're amusing ourselves to death. And so contemplation of big questions like why are we here and where are we going and, and how are we to live and, and does God exist and how can we know him and, and do we exist? Those things are, are just avoided in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a naive pluralism. There's no home for such big questions. And the culture we live in, number four, emphasizes then a kind of subjective privatism and sincerity. Those are the things that get the highest value. So the question's about what, what fits for me, what, what, what I desire, and the things that I am sincere about. It, it's a culture that, that prizes tastes over truth, preferences over propositions. And, and because of that, any rigorous thinking and engagement with difference gets muted. And then a fifth thing, consequent to the last thing, that in this naive pluralism, religion gets regarded in highly pragmatic and consumeristic terms. So religion gets, gets evaluated in terms of what works for me and what do I want to purchase with my own time or other sets of resources? It's a pragmatism beneath the culture when it comes to thinking about religion. And not surprisingly, number six then, we live in a culture that does not prize absolutes, that does not prize certainty or universals or superlatives. Asking a question like which religion is best is just simply off limits, or, or which religion is true, just doesn't get raised, because the very idea of, of fundamentals and universals and absolutes find very little place with us. You're probably familiar with the old story that's used in team building exercises and other things where, where it tells a story about three blind men, each groping an elephant, one, one has the trunk and think he is holding a snake and the other is wrapping his arms around a, an elephant's leg and thinks it's a tree and someone else is in the middle rubbing the, the middle of the elephant and thinks it's yet a third thing and, and the argument goes, well, they each know truth according to their perspective, a kind of perspectivalism. Well, that's, that's dominant in the culture. And it keeps us from saying, but yeah, there's one elephant in the room. The truth is there's an elephant in the room. However partial is the particular views of the thing. So basically, wherever a, a naive pluralism reigns, a kind of religious gullibility reigns with it. And just when Western culture is, is becoming most uncritical, unthinking, and naive, and accepting, and open in its pluralism, 
in comes Islam. Now the irony is this, despite some, some brief periods, some historic periods of, of, of openness, Islam is not fundamentally a liberal or pluralistic religion. So what happens when a culture becomes naively pluralistic and encounters a religious system that is not? Well, the culture welcomes the religious system with wide open arms and the religious system slowly works towards dominance. And that's why it's important to ask the second set of questions that we want to consider. What is Islam and why is it not consistently compatible with this kind of pluralism? Well, Islam is a religion, of course, but not primarily a theology. Islam is a religion, but not primarily a theology. It's a religion with one major creed, the shahada, or confession that God is one and Muhammad is his messenger. This means that as Christians, if we think of Islam in, in primarily in categories typical to, to Christian ways of thinking theologically, systematic categories, for example, we'll fundamentally misunderstand what Islam is. I mean, in one sense, given Islam's sort of radical view of God's transcendence, of his, his utter otherness, it would not be too much to say that in one sense, Islam is an agnostic religion. Because God is so radically other, the Muslim does not believe he can say anything about the essence of God. This is why in, in Islamic theology and Islamic history, there's this long-running debate about the 99 attributes of Allah. Whether or not we can talk about those attributes as saying something essential about the nature of God, or whether we must accept them as descriptions of how God acts in the world. It's because at the heart, the basic view of, of God is that he's radically transcendent and other. And this is why Islamic theology also in one sense can be boiled down to a series of negations, what God is not, rather than assertions, what he is. And so if we're gonna engage Islam well, we have to understand that Islam is a religion, but not primarily a theology. And secondly, we have to understand that Islam is, is not an institution, but primarily an identity. Islam is not an institution, but primarily an identity. So when we think of being Christians, most of us retain as a primary identifier some other category. So we think of ourselves as, as Baptist Christians or Presbyterian Christians, denominationally speaking. Or we think of ourselves as African American Christians or Asian Christians or Irish Christians. There's another identifier that, that plays a prominent role in our self-understanding. Islam reverses that. What is primary is to be Muslim, and what is secondary is to be ethnic or some other thing. So Islam lays great stress on the, the brotherhood of all Muslims and lays great stress on the, the solidarity of, of all Muslims as, as those who are participants in Islam and make secondary those other considerations that are so often prominent in our thinking. Of first importance is to be Muslim. And this has been from its, its earliest history, from the time of the Prophet Muhammad and, 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 the, and the companions and the caliphs that followed him. This has been Islam's inner logic and tendency from its early history to build a new community whose primary identity is Islam itself, is to be Muslim. As one writer put it, one Muslim writer puts it, in the last analysis, the solidarity engendered by Islam stems not from a rallying institution or figure, but from pride of belonging. Over a billion people practice Islam through the Middle East and North Africa, through Indonesia, North America, South America, almost every patch of land on this globe, every, over a billion people are, are, are practicing Muslims. And whether he be a Nigerian or a Pakistani, an Egyptian or an Iranian, his historical heritage favors pride of identity inside the pale of Islam over belonging to any other sort of national group. This is why any perceived attack against Islam, the religion, 
gets regarded as an attack against Muslims everywhere. You may remember a couple years ago the, the cartoons in one new European newspaper that were unflattering of the Prophet Muhammad. You may remember the outcry that went up not just from that country but from Muslims all over the world. Why? I mean, to understand that, you have to understand that, that basically they're thinking of themselves as Muslim wherever they are and not primarily in ethnic or local or national categories. So Islam is an identity, not an institution. A third thing, Islam has religious pillars, but it is a system for governing all of life. Islam, ha Islam has religious pillars, but it's a, a system for governing all of life. In other words, you, you cannot reduce Islam to the five pillars of Islam the five religious practices of Islam, because Islam seeks to speak to and to govern not just the religious practice of its adherents, but the entire society and the entire life of its adherents. So yes, there are the five pillars which, which emerge as a kind of consensus understanding, a, a, a basic understanding of the religious duties of the faith, the confession of faith, shahada, prayer, fasting, giving of alms, making the hajj. You realize even in, in earlier Islamic history there was a debate about a sixth pillar. Some people would say that jihad is the fifth pillar. Others would say jihad or striving in the cause of Islam runs through the entire practice of the faith. And so you get this, this idea of Islam predicated upon the pillars. But if you reduce it to that sort of religious set of activities, you're going to fundamentally misunderstand what it is. The major goal of Islam is Dar al-Islam, to bring the house of Islam, to bring society under the precepts of, of Islam, under the teachings and the practices of Islam, and to regulate every area of society by that preaching, by that practice. Now, incidentally, this is, as, as a convert from Islam, this is, this is one of those things that makes me very nervous about a lot of, a lot of conversation about contextualization in the Muslim world, particularly that form of contextualization that says, okay, you get a convert from a Muslim background and you essentially leave them in the outward Muslim practices and performances. Now, what that misunderstands is that as integral to Islam as the inward practice is the outward practice. That Islam is significantly constituted by outward form. And if you take someone who is a, a, convert, a convert from that background and you leave them in that outward form, let, let me just tell you from experience, I don't know that you're serving them as best you can. I, it, it, it would take me years to take the Quran down from its exalted place in my house, even though I had been a Christian for some time. The reverence for the book was, was so strong, even though I didn't believe it anymore. It, the system still had tentacles on me. And converts need to be helped with that, even if it means wisely facing persecution and other risks. That's an aside. But Islam, its goal is to seek the conforming of society to the, to the teaching, to the, to the precepts, to the commands of the faith. And how is that done? Well, it's done, not done primarily by teaching the pillars of Islam. It's done primarily by advancing Sharia, by advancing the law of Islam. So if you want to think about Islam more carefully, you have to think in some ways about Sharia. And where does Sharia come from? And what is it? Well, Sharia is basically the system of laws, as I've been saying, that, that govern Islamic life. Now, one Muslim writer describes Sharia as, listen to this, the epitome of the true Islamic spirit the most decisive expression of Islamic thought, the essential kernel of Islam. 
Another Muslim writer says it very simply, the Sharia is Islam's constitution. And for many Muslims and Muslim leaders, the Sharia is, the, is really the fullest embodiment of, of the Islamic ideal. That's what we're contending with, not prayer on Friday. That's what we're contending with, Sharia. That's what we have to encounter and, and lovingly engage, the whole of it, not just a few practices or theological points over here. And from the beginning of the spread of Islam, the Islamic community needed, needed basically more than just the five pillars to, to shape and govern life. In the generations that, that follow, indeed in, in the Prophet's own generation, Islam entered into more and more land, spreading from the Arab Peninsula and the Arab world on into Southeast Asia, parts of Europe, and over into North Africa. And as it did so, empires and great caliphates were, were established and founded. And as it did so, it needed to answer this question. How do we regulate life under an Islamic ideal with such diversity of peoples who are, who are either through conquest or conversion or caravan trading coming into Islam? It's a pressing question of authority and of coherence. How are we going to govern this life. And in the first two to three centuries of, of Islam, of the, of the era of Islam, basically what you have is the development and the codification of Sharia. And there are four things that go into the formulation of Sharia. First of all is the Quran itself. Every Muslim believes that the Quran is God's revealed will for man's life. In it are the signs or miracles given to the Prophet Muhammad that are to be obeyed and are to govern Islamic life. But pretty early on, it was clear to, to Muslim leaders that, that the application of the Quran and the working out of the Quran uh, needed some, let's call it commentary. And so particularly after the, during the Prophet's own lifetime, he, he formed not only as a religious leader, or served not as a religious leader, but also as a, as a civic leader and a judge. And after his lifetime, the, the, the companions of the Prophet and the, and the, the rising caliphate in, in Sunni, Sunni Islam, had to figure out, okay, we are, as we go across this world, encountering cultures and people not like our own, how do we bring them under Islamic rule? And so added to the Quran, secondly, is a source of Sharia, were what's called the Sunnah and the Hadith. The Sunnah, recording the, the behaviors and the, and the, and the uh, the ways of the prophet himself, and the hadith setting down the sayings of the prophet. And pretty soon the, the sunnah and the hadith, at least in the minds of, of some orthodox uh, Muslim theologians, took on a kind of authority comparable to the Quran. And so today you will meet some Muslims who would, who would say, you, you can't properly understand the Quran unless you speak Arabic and unless you also read it in the context of the hadith, for example. And you have a few others who will even go so far as to say that, that the hadith, because it is the sayings of the prophet and the sunnah, because it is the life of the prophet, that, that those things are, are actually having authority quite comparable to the Quran. So the Sharia gets built not only on the revelation of the Quran, but on the example of the prophet as well. An example of Muhammad's life and his sayings and teachings as he led the, the early Islamic community. But pretty soon that too wasn't sufficient for this growing empire and bringing everything under the reign of Islam. So a third thing, religious belief and practices could be established by the principle of analogy. So one question that rises in Islamic history is, okay, we've got the Quran, we've got the Hadith, we've got Sunnah, and yet there are these instances that keep coming to us in a much larger, much more bureaucratized, even much more diverse Islamic kingdom that aren't answered directly by the Quran or by the Hadith and the Sunnah. What do we do there? And, and in Muslim jurisprudence, what you have is this principle of analogy. So that if the Quran or the Hadith don't speak directly to a particular situation, what you're looking for is some analogy in a situation that is spoken to. It can be an analogy of cause or motive or some material fact. And then you, you reason from that analogy to your situation and you make law. 
Now, there's an uneasiness in Islam historically about how widely the Quran and other things could be interpreted. There's a resistance to innovation and individual interpretation, which means as, as, as analogies are being added, there's also this tendency to, to codify and settle pretty quickly. There's a, there's a fourth thing, and we'll talk about why these are important. There was the consensus of the communities that became a part of Sharia. In other words, there was this, this notion of tradition, things that were practiced and always had been practiced that were not necessarily viewed as in conflict with the Quran or the Hadith, that, that enjoying community consensus also became a part of, a part of Sharia. So that by the third century after the Prophet's lifetime, there was this tradition incorporated into the very legal framework of Islam. And this is how Sharia developed. And over time, the joining of Quran, Muhammad's lifetime, or, or life in the Sunnah and the Hadith, and of, of, of Islamic analogy and rule and culture, you get the formation of Sharia, and it's under this that Muslims seek to live. There are three challenges, though, to this that are being faced by the Muslim world since the rise of the West. There is the, the West itself, with its, its, its sort of cultural and philosophical and religious orientation, which is seen to be at odds with Islam, and the military power of the West, which soon dominated parts of the Islamic world, until you get what is viewed commonly as the, as the low point of Islamic history and the fall of the Ottoman Empire. So there's the West, and then there is secularism, and Islamic aversion to the very idea of a, of a secular state and a secular life, some life lived apart from the dictates of God. And then there's concern about internal weakness in Islam itself. You travel the Middle East and you hear this concern about the loss of Islamic roots and the loss of Islamic practice. And when that happens, what you're, what you're finding in some parts of the world are, are three groups that, that are sort of developing as, a, as reformist groups. On the one hand, you get traditionalists, or who are sometimes called fundamentalists. And they say the way back to an Islamic golden age is to advance a more pristine Sharia and thereby reform society. We find that approach in the, in, among Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia and the Sudan, among leaders in Libya and Qatar and the UAE and, and Iran. That's the traditionalist view. Then you also have the modernist view. The modernists say, look, we need to keep together society and Sharia, but what we need to do is reform Sharia and advance society. And this is the approach we find in places like Egypt and India, Syria, and Indonesia. And there's a third group, smaller group, which are the secularists who want to divide religious matters from secular matters of the state. And you see that influential in Turkey, for example. Here's the problem. Most Muslims on the street and in the courts, ground level and the elites, are going to be either modernists or traditionalists. And the traditionalists often ride the coattails of the modernists. So you can engage Islam and see what appears to be a fairly moderate face, and, and in engaging that and accepting that on some terms, you will also find yourself accepting or welcoming or finding a much more traditionalist much more, uh, as we would say, fundamentalist version of Islam. And the consequence of that is that cultures and societies find themselves facing the encroachment of Sharia more and more often. Now, why is Sharia not consistently compatible with pluralism? Four quick things. Because Sharia at its best is theocratic and it is at least theonomistic. Sharia stands on a very different footing 
than American constitutional law. If the Sharia is the constitution of Islam, then, then the constitution of Islam uh, offers a very different kind of jurisprudence than the constitution, for example, of, of the United States. For the constitution of the United States grounds itself in natural law and individual liberty. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are endowed by their creator with certainly, certain un, unalienable rights. Among them, the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Sharia says we hold this to be self-evident. God rules all things, and all of society must be brought under Islam, the rule of Islam. Now, because, number two, Sharia leaves no room for flexibility and modernization and interpretation and the addition of law, it, it, it leaves no room for, for the kind of pluralism that's healthy. So, so with a bias toward, against innovation and a bias against interpretation, the Sharia remains largely locked in a 9th or 10th century Islamic world and context. And it works again against the kind of pluralism that's healthy. A third reason. Because Sharia incorporates cultural consensus into its formulation, into its law, excuse me, into its, into its law, <clears throat> then certain cultural practices enter into the legal framework of countries unawares. Now, when I say cultural practice, in our context, we tend to think of culture as maybe related to religion, but something that's kind of distinct from religion. So, so a person can participate in a, in a, in a certain cultural, uh, cultural sort of milieu, and we don't necessarily make any kind of religious assumption about that cultural practice at all. In Islam, culture is religion, and religion is culture. So to admit into the legal framework of a country like the United States elements of Sharia, or, or under the guise of cultural practice, wearing the, the veil, for example, is to, is to be giving ground to Sharia and a constitutional footing quite at odds with the one that's already found, this country is founded upon. So, so think, for example, about, um, you know, we saw in France the, 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 the news reports about the, the protests for uh, women to wear the veil to get their driver's license. And often the, the argument given is, well, this is a part of our culture. And that sounds one way to us with a the, with the sort of pluralist, pluralistic mindset about culture. But it's also more than that. It's part of that culture that has been enshrined in Sharia. And in making that a, a part of the legal framework in any society, the Western-style democracy, pluralism is to basically be enshrining Sharia. And so we ought to be careful. Uh, about that. A fourth thing. Advocacy for Sharia sometimes reaches a point where it cannot tolerate differences or accept its minority status. If Muslim communities come to define Sharia as the only acceptable framework for living freely and worshiping freely as Muslims, then we're able to understand why in some countries with substantial Muslim minorities, you see the kind of efforts to succeed from the union of the country and to create separate states, as, you were, as it were, that are Muslim states. We, we see that in the Philippines, we see that in Indonesia, and if, and if living under Sharia is defined as the only acceptable way to live as a Muslim in a, in a non-Muslim country, we, we understand then why, at least among some people, a kind of militaristic and radical and violent protest emerges. And this too, I would argue, is incompatible with a healthy pluralism. Well, we should come then to our, our final question quickly. What should the Christian response be to Islam? The Christian lives in two kingdoms, in two cities. The Christian is both a citizen of a nation, a citizen of heaven. 
And therefore, our response must distinguish between these two kingdoms and, and distinguish our responsibilities in these two kingdoms. So when I'm asked a question, how should we respond to Islam, I'm really being asked a, a kind of political question in most cases. And the question usually wants to know how to act as a citizen of the United States in responding to the growth of Islam, for example. They're asking almost a policy level question. And, and here's the answer I would, I would give. As a citizen of the United States in particular, and I, I realize there are people here from other countries as well, but as a citizen, work for the faithful continuance of the non-establishment and free exercise clause. Work for the faithful continuance and application of the non-establishment and free exercise clause. Constitutionally, Congress shall not make any laws that establish religion or prohibits the, the free exercise thereof. I think that's constant. I think that's a bit of genius. Uh, granted, it's, it's not well applied always, but it, but it needs to be, especially in our, in our engagement with Islam. What the non-establishment clause really, really prohibits is the adoption of laws that make a religion something the state supports. This means, I think, that at, at least in the American constitutional system, Sharia and elements of Sharia are off limits. The main way to hold back the inappropriate advance of Islamic law and custom, which tend to restrict what we would regard as basic liberties, is to consistently apply the non-establishment clause. Write your congressman. But at the same time, Congress cannot make any laws that prohibit the free exercise of religion. So here we want to defend our Muslim neighbor's right to worship God according to the dictates of his own conscience and not be afraid of that. We, we want to be, as, as Christians who are also citizens of, a, of an earthly kingdom, we, we want to be hospitable, we want to be kind, we want to work for that most fundamental liberty of, of worshiping God according to your own dictates, and, and we want to work for that freedom of religion that allows us to engage them honestly and faithfully in the gospel. And so as, as citizens of this earthly realm, that's how I think we maintain a good pluralism. We, we resist the establishment of religion as law, and we fight for the freedom of religion in practice. Now, I'm also asked the question sometimes, how should we respond to Muslims? How do I talk to my Muslim neighbor or friend about the gospel or religious things? That's not a policy level question, that's kind of a street level question. How do I engage my coworker? How do I engage my neighbor? And here I would counsel just a few things drawn from the Lord Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 10. First thing, remember the gospel. Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, Jesus sends his disciples out. He says, as you go, preach this message, the kingdom of heaven is near. That as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, our, our main responsibility is the, is the heralding of this news and the, and the proclamation of this Savior. As we go to work, go to school, go to play, preach this message, the kingdom of heaven has come. Make Christ known. Speak of his glory. Speak of his cross. Speak of his resurrection. Speak of his love. Speak of his grace. Be ambassadors of Christ. I think one of the most significant challenges to us as, a, as Christian people is what I fear is a lack of confidence in the gospel. When I'm asked that question, how do I witness to my, my Muslim friend or neighbor? Most people want me to tell them something, tell them about something other than the gospel. They want a trick, they want a secret. What worked for you? Can I push that same button? The button was the gospel. The secret was Christ and him crucified and buried and resurrected to save sinners from the wrath of a holy God and make them new and bring them into the family of God.
I just, I, I just want us to be, to be confident in the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And you realize that when, when our mouths are open and, and the gospel comes out, divine power comes out. The word of God gives, gives life and makes people new. Oh, well, think about that, how powerful your, your speech is. Apart from God, we're the only speaking beings in creation, and the particular speech that, that holds the most power is that, that speech of the gospel. Remember the gospel and, and be confident in the gospel and speak of Christ. And that same gospel which saved you and me is the power of God unto salvation for that Muslim neighbor or friend you're lovingly concerned about. Remember the gospel. And number two, return to the world. Jesus says in Matthew 10, verse 16, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Now, now that's a verse that calls the Christian to be a thinker. <laughs> to be as shrewd as snakes and yet to be pure, to be as innocent as doves. It calls us to face devouring wolves. You notice that? Jesus says to his disciples, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. There's a lot of animals in this verse, but it's not a petting zoo. <laughs> the world's a dangerous place. And Christ sends his people into it. But don't you think that because Christ sends us into the world as sheep for the slaughter, that he's wasting our lives? He's not. The Father will not waste the lives of those he has purchased with the blood of his Son. So Jesus says, go. Go into the world with this gospel and know you need to be wise and you need to be pure, for it's a dangerous world that opposes you. And look at the instruction he gives there in verses 17 to 20. He says, you're going to see persecution. In verses 21 to 23, you're going to be betrayed even by, by family members. And I don't know anyone who knows that truth as deeply and painfully as men and women converted out of Muslim backgrounds. I think of the young man from a Saudi family that I met on one of my trips to the Middle East. He listened to me talk. And he'd come up to me. He had been a student in the United States at Baylor, and he had come to faith in Christ. And during the Christmas break one year, he'd gone home, and he had put in his bag, stashed away his Bible and some Christian CDs, and his mother went through his things and, and found them and confronted him and said, Have you been converted? Have you been baptized? And under the, under the threat of disownment at least, and worse, he was forced to recant, he was put under house arrest for a couple years, essentially. And he was finally able to, to, to go to another school in the Middle East because they would not allow him to go back to Baylor. Christ had just been burdening him. He grieved that he had ever forsaken his Savior. And he was coming up to me to ask me, how do I, how do I go back to Saudi and, and tell my parents to live as Christ, to die as gain? We, we are afraid in a country where we have every advantage. And there's a people out there who needs us to be wise and engaged and faithful because they face every disadvantage. Persecution and betrayal, verses 24 and 25, slander. But despite the persecution, despite the betrayal, despite the slander, we are to go out under Jesus' orders. He sends us out to engage. It's no surprise to me that in lands that used to be dominated by Christian influence, in that part of the world, which are now thoroughly Muslim lands, that the rise of monasticism was quite strong. The withdrawal from the culture and the engagement of the people with the gospel. It's no surprise to me. So we are to return to the world. Number three, we are to repent of fear. Verse 28, 
Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. The one who has all authority in heaven and earth promises to be with us always. And it is this one who says to us, do not be afraid. We, we have some repenting to do. Because we have been fearful and in our fear we have been unbelieving. And we have been unfaithful. The fear is destroying our love for our neighbors. And fear is destroying evangelistic and missionary zeal. And fear is leading to the destruction of souls. I mean, do you, do you hear the Lord's words hanging at the end of this sentence? The one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's horrifying. I remember a man on a radio call-in talk show was talking about the book, and he called in, and, and he said this to me. He says, now, listen, they don't want us over there. They don't want the gospel. You know, Christians are being killed and run out of the country and, and all of this stuff. Why don't we just stay here because they don't want the gospel anyway and leave them over there? I just, have you not heard of hell? Have you not thought long about the horrors and the torments and the suffering of eternal damnation? Have, have you not thought about love? You do not know what spirit you are of. We must repent of this paralyzing fear in verses 29 to 31 and think instead on God's providence and provision. His eye is on the sparrow. I know he watches me. Oh. A final thing. I've been too long. Thank you for your patience. We must, number four, retrieve the reward. We must retrieve the reward. Verses 39 and 42. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. If anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. Christian, throw away safety, throw away comfort, throw away convenience, forsake it. It's a trap. It makes us soft and fat and lazy and unloving. Lose it and go. Give your life for something greater, for the glory of God and the joy of God and the embracing of God. Christ is our reward. God is our portion. He is our inheritance. And this same God who says, remember the gospel and preach it and, and go out into the world as a, as a lamb, a sheep among wolves and, and re do not fear. This same God says at the end of it, even for something as small as an act of mercy and giving a cup of water in his name, at the end of it, great will be your reward. And can you imagine that day? As the psalmist says in Psalm 17, 15, when we awake in our righteousness, we shall see him and be satisfied. That's what's on the other end of the Christian's engagement with Islam. Satisfaction joy unspeakable and full of glory. Don't you want it? Let's go get it. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this time. Lord, oh, make, make this helpful. Make this helpful, please. Useful in our souls. Stir up your people, Lord. Oh, Lord, we're in a room full of people who know the gospel. And so they know everything they need to see their Muslim neighbor and friends come to know you. Grant us confidence that comes from resting in your power and not our eloquence. Grant us, grant us boldness that comes from resting in your grace, O oh Lord, and, and not our thoughts and intellectualism, Lord, but, but do, Lord. 
So, Lord, make us bold with this gospel that we might open our mouths and speak as we ought. And that the Muslim people made in your image, made for your glory, intended to be around your throne for all of eternity, might hear this good news and be saved to the glory of your name and the joy of the nations. Amen.